So for this episode of Idea Channel, we're gonna be talking about 3D printing and all of the challenges that 3D printing is bringing to intellectual property. And to do that, we're gonna talk with my friend, Michael Weinberg uh, from Shapeways, which is a, well, I'll let you describe yourself and what Shapeways does. So Shapeways is a 3D printing company, but what we do is not manufacture 3D printers, but we have these big industrial 3D printers in a factory. And so if you want access to that 3D printer, you just design something, you upload it, and we can print it and send it to you. Or you can design something and upload it and open a shop and we'll print it on demand for any customer who wants to buy it from you and we'll just send you a markup. And you are there, I don't want to mess up your title. <laughs> I am, I'm a general counsel. General counsel. I'm the only lawyer at Shapeways. Okay. So I worry about all the legal stuff, but I spend a lot of time thinking about intellectual property law and the rules that govern our community to make sure that everyone can know what to expect when they're using 3D printers. And just to get this out of the way, so that we've been very specific and above board, um, have we paid you or Shapeways anything? You have not. Has Shapeways paid us anything? We have not. I think before we get really into the weeds talking about how 3D printing is sort of breaking copyright uh, and intellectual property, maybe we should just cover the groundwork of what exactly it is 3D printing is and does. So 3D printing is a technology that lets you take a digital file and turn it into a physical thing. And it cuts the object up into super thin layers. And then there's a machine, the 3D printer, that builds that object up one layer at a time. And it can use all sorts of technology to do that and all sorts of materials. But the core idea is instead of having a block of something and cutting away until you have the object you want, which is traditional manufacturing, with 3D printing, you just build it up from nothing. And so you just have layer and layer and layer and layer until you have that one object. Is every 3D printer an extruder? You're always, ex you're extruding something. Not every 3D okay. printer. And so most of the 3D printers that we have at the factory are not those types of 3D printers. Okay. So those printers are the ones that you know if you've seen them on desktops and things like that. The way that ours usually work are sometimes there is a, a bed of powder and then it kind of does powder and then a little bit of glue that is specifically designed to be in a place. There are also machines that use a laser or some sort of light source. Immediately, know, immediately right? on board. Laser, 3D printer, <laughs> what? That basically, they either use it to melt if you have a bed of metal filings and you shoot the laser at the metal filings to center them, to turn them into a solid piece. But all of them at their core, they're thinking about building a layer, moving up a little bit, and building a slightly differently shaped layer until you form an object that has all sorts of physical properties. I think this brings us now to the last thing that I wanna to touch on really briefly before we get into the intellectual property weeds, which is 3D printing community. It is an incredible community of people that are, it's growing and becoming more and more diverse every day. But you've got one group of people who are attracted to 3D printing from a kind of engineering, tinkering, hacking standpoint, where they just they think it's a really neat engineering challenge. They're really interested in the machines and how to make the machines work and how to design functional things that they need every day. Right. And so they're kind of the, the engineering oriented people are coming in and that's a huge vein of people in that community. And the other side are a bunch of designers who say, I've had all these things in my head that I have had no way to sure. bring into the real world and this is how I'm going to do it. And this is so, I'm gonna use this technology to make that happen. I think there's a bunch of other pods of people, there are educators mm -hmm. who really see this as a way of bringing kids in through various means. They say, oh, we'll teach you design, we'll teach you math, we'll teach you engineering, and there's the physical component, it's not just on a screen. And then there's a little universe of lawyers who are, <laughs> who are attracted to it for right. interesting reasons of just sort of legal policy issues. We have this community of people that are hacking on both t the technology and the objects themselves that then pushes up against the law that has existed for so long to control those things. From what I understand, it's complicated to know what object or what kind of object is protected. Is that true? Like it's, yeah. it's sort of, it seems like it's on a case by case basis. I hope it's not ultimately a case by case basis, but I think that's exactly the first problem for most, for your average person who's doing 3D printing and 
is thinking about intellectual property. They learned about intellectual property through the internet where you're thinking about the music and the movies and the photographs and all those things. And so if you're trying to figure out, am I infringing on a song? Am I infringing on a movie? Am I infringing on a blog post? Your starting point is it's protected by copyright. Yeah. I'm gonna do a copyright analysis. Right. The easy kind of shorthand you can use is if it's a functional object, it's outside the scope of copyright. If it's a non-functional, if it's a decorative object, if it's a sculpture, it's within the world of copyright. And so your first rule of thumb is that functional, non-functional. What are some examples of functional objects? So a hinge. Okay. Or a, a handle for a door or a you know a piece to hold a shower curtain in place. Okay. Things that basically, if you're an engineer designing something, you're probably designing a functional, functional. part. Okay. If it has functional pieces that, you know, the tolerances matter, <laughs> if it's gonna perform something you wanna perform, that's, you're in functional land, you're probably largely outside of the scope of copyright. With 3D printing, there are lots of objects that are protected by copyright because they're non-functional creative works. But there are also a lot of objects that are functional works that are categorically excluded from copyright protection because they're functional works. And so they may be protected by patent, they may be protected by trademark, but instead of the first question you have to ask yourself is, is this infringement on copyright? The first question you have to ask yourself backs up a step and says, what if anything protects this, uh, this work? Right. Is it protected by copyright? Is it protected by trademark? Is it protected by patent? Because the answer to that question governs the whole rest of the show. Cool. And, that sh and that question is not as easy to answer as you might want to be. <laughs> And that's, I think, one of the big challenges for people is it's requiring them to know even more law than you already have to know when you're thinking about copyright stuff, which is already a lot of law. A lot of law. And so what is the likelihood that someone is going to print something that infringes on a patent of a functional object? So that's where it gets complicated again. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> so so with, with copyright, with things in the copyright world, Copyright protection is automatic. Yeah. If you are categorically eligible for copyright protection, your thing is protected by copyright. If you're in the functional world and you are categorically eligible for patent, that doesn't mean you have a patent. You still need to go and get it. Yeah. And so the question isn't even, what is the likelihood that someone's gonna print something that's functional because it could infringe on a patent? The question is, they're gonna print a functional thing that is also protected by patent. And that's a smaller universe than copyrightable thing that's protected by copyright because that universe is sort of a one-to-one -one mapping. Right, you know if it's a creative thing, you know it's covered. Right, right. And so I think the likelihood that you're gonna infringe on a patent is much smaller because the number of things in the world that are protected by patent is much smaller than the number of things in the world that are protected by copyright. One thing I've heard, and I don't know, I think this was from a specific person, so I, I regret not knowing who it is. They said that 3D printing is gonna do for objects what MP3s did for music. There are many people who've said things like, okay, when I say it's gonna be like the MP3 of objects, I mean piracy everywhere, the world's gonna fall apart, <laughs> right, yeah. this is gonna be horrible, and the question is sort of what do you do? When the music industry was hit by MP3s, there was no shared commercial experience as to what to do in that situation. They responded to MP3s basically in three stages, right? Their first stage was sue all your customers, <laughs> which alienated a whole generation of people, uh, didn't stop the internet, yeah. and wasn't very effective. And their next stage was build these really elaborate digital locks. Yeah. And all of which got broken. All of which got broken, none of which really achieved any useful purpose but it cost them a lot of money and alienated a bunch of people who were left. Yep. So they went through two stages where it was very expensive and very costly in terms of customer relations, but not very productive for them. And then they finally kind of moved into this third stage where they said to themselves, okay, there's clearly a demand for this stuff, for digital music. So let's spend some time and money finding a way to bring that market to people. The lesson kind of over and over is you approach it as, okay, how do we meet this market? That's the more effective way to do it. So I read, um, and I'll put a link to this in the description. Um, I read a, a paper where someone was suggesting essentially content ID for objects for 3D printers, where when you send your object file to the 3D printer to print, it checks a global database yeah. of objects to find out whether or not it infringes in any way. Yeah. So that's just one way. Yeah, I mean, these are, there's a whole universe of kind of cockamamie schemes that people have <laughs> of protecting things, yeah, where there's 
a whitelist or a blacklist built into the printer, or there are certain things that printers will and will not print, mm -hmm. or files are verified as legitimate before they're printed out it by printers. It goes through some authority or something. Yeah, like. and I think all of these fail the same reason that a lot of DRM fails, which is if it's not bringing value to the end customer, they have no interest in maintaining it. You're either gonna avoid it or figure out a way through yeah, it. Yeah, and so it kind of, it, it doesn't get in the way of people who, who wanna circumvent it, but it gets in the way of those edge cases, which may be significant, of people who are doing something that's legitimate, but just wasn't thought up by the person who constructed the DRM structure. Mm -hmm. There is a version of a verification that actually could be really valuable. Okay. Where if you are someone who wants a physical object, or wants to download a file to print your own physical object, and you wanna know that you trust the source of the object. This is an example that's been said to me before, I think it makes a lot of sense, is if you're a pilot of a small plane and you land at a random airfield somewhere mm -hmm. and something is broken, something that you want, need to get a piece for to be able to fly again, and it turns out you can 3D print the part. If you're at a random airfield, you wanna know that the file came like from- a thousand percent. The people yeah. came who, make, who made your, your plane, that the printer, that you used for the file was capable of printing that object, that it was calibrated correctly, yeah. and that it actually came out of that printer when the guy who you don't know handed it to you. Yeah. And so as an end user looking at that object, or as any way, any further up that chain, there you want tools that can verify the source of that object. You know, when you're installing packages on a computer or something, you have checksums that make sure that it's exactly. a verified, yeah, it's a, a very similar. Exactly, that, that kind of digital verification I can see it becoming yeah. really valuable. Yeah, which is yeah, it's not it's, again like not like you said not it's not DRM, it's more verification, which is right great creating value for I mean, even for artists, right? I mean, so there are artists who will want to put things out and it's a limited run, and maybe they'll build those checksums into the objects. That's not going to prevent somebody else from knocking off the object. But, but if you're a collector and the and part of the value you get from it is to know that that certificate is, of right, authenticity is real then you really care about that. And that can be really valuable. So that's the kind of digital verification that I think is yeah. is useful, as opposed to this, we're gonna stop people <laughs> gonna, from printing various we're gonna, things. We're um, gonna melt down RFID chips <laughs> into <laughs> the plastic that gets extruded. Right. It has to pass through. Uh, Micro dots. Yeah. Yeah. Micro dots. <laughs> <laughs>a lot of this conversation has been about the potential questions that arise and sometimes the crisis and all of these sort of trying to figure out this thing while we're doing it. It's like building the car while you're driving it. In the future, like what are things that members of these communities and even, you know, interested parties like myself who might not have a 3D printer, but you know, I still look at, I still look at the internet, right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like what are things like, what is the, what should be on our checklist? There are a lot of open legal issues yeah. that are not completely clear. And when those issues get brought before a judge, one of the questions a judge is gonna ask is, what is the norm in the community? Uh. What's going on with the community? And so it's really important right now that the community, consciously or not consciously, the norms that they're setting as what's okay, what's not okay, what works, what doesn't work, that's what is the starting point yeah. for all the policy and legal decisions that come after it. So there's a huge burden on the community. I think it's a responsibility, but it's a responsibility that I hope that the community is embracing to say the decisions we make today are going to impact all the law and policy that comes out of it. Yeah. And so this is the time to be conscientious about what is what we think should be okay and not okay and how this should work. I feel like a recent one was a manufacturer trying to make it so that you could only use their plastic in their machine was sort of one of those moments of, oh God, we now we have to deal with this. Yeah, there have been times where there are kind of manufacturers who are kind of tying plastic to machines. There was an instance on Thingiverse a couple of months ago where somebody downloaded a bunch of files and started selling the, the prints on eBay oh, wow. in a way that made people really uncomfortable. And the process to resolve that was uh, contentious. Yeah. <laughs> but I think ultimately it really did highlight the norms and expectations in the community. And it was valuable in the long term, even though it was a bit of a bumpy ride right. in the short term. Well, thank you so much, Michael, for coming. Thanks for having uh, me. And for taking us around the Shapeways factory. Absolutely. You can find Michael on Twitter at mweinberg2d. Two-dimensional medium. Two-dimensional medium. 2D. Uh, and we'll put some links to some of the other things that he's written in places that he's been on the internet in the doobly-doo. So, let's high five.
Let us know your thoughts, ideas, and especially your questions about 3D printing and copyright in the comments below, and I will respond to some of them in next week's comment response video. If there are any really good questions, which I'm sure there are gonna be tons, I'm gonna see if I can swindle Michael into answering some of them. Uh, Michael, if you're seeing this for the first time, thanks in advance. In this week's comment response video, we talk about your thoughts regarding the difference between the past and history. If you wanna watch that one, you can click right here or find a link in the doobly-doo. Also some very exciting news this week, the second Idea Channel shirt is now available. The illustration was done by our good friend Andrea, who did the illustration for the light bulb t-shirt, and uh, it is available today on DFTBA.com. So we'll put a card and a link in the description if you want to buy a t-shirt. In case you missed it, I was in an episode of the Mental Floss List show talking about New York City, the city that I live in. If you want to watch that, we'll also put links around. This week's tweets of the week come from Terrible at SFE, who points us towards the Ukraine's entry for Eurovision this year, which is rightfully so and very interestingly um, political. And TJ Von P, who points us towards a piece on um, brutalism, like from architecture, in web design. I don't think I agree with 100% of the statements made in the piece, but it is, I think, a, uh, an interesting way to look at design and architecture and the internets. We have a Facebook, an IRC, and a subreddit links in the doobly-doo. And of course, this week's episode would not have been possible or good without the hard work of these very functional objects.